Okay, hey, welcome back. We got our 20 minute break. This is the uh, day 10 again. This is uh, lecture number uh, two. And so we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. And as you know, <clears throat> we were talking about fluids and uh, looking at the physics. And we spent a long time talking about Archimedes' principle. And so hopefully you'll be able to kind of work through those problems because I must say, the problems are a little challenging um, <clears throat> because you are just given the principle that says, hey, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. And your author kind of requires you to kind of think that through and kind of come up with your own set of equations and your own logic. And that can be a little tough. That's why I actually did some numbers right before we uh, finished that, that last video. I wanted to do like the uh, percentage underwater uh, because, he, you know, I don't think your author does that. He just says, hey, just, just, just reason it out yourself. And uh, Anyways, I've got a lot of questions in the past about that, but let's do the last part of this chapter and call it quits to chapter 12. And that was a discovery by Bernoulli. And so the two big principles with fluids is the first one is Archimedes' principle, and the second one now is Bernoulli's. So we call it the Bernoulli effect, and kind of the best way I can explain it is maybe something like this. Um, imagine we had a pipe of some type. Um, and again, it could be any fluid, so it could be filled with air, it could be filled with water, it could be filled with petroleum. Um, I'll keep talking about air and water because that's what I have out here in the lab to, to, to work with. But here's this, this pipe, if you will, and in this pipe there are these molecules. And so in this case, I'll just make little dots and say these are the dots representing the H2O molecules, and so they're kind of all over uh, the place. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, remember the kinetic theory from chapter 11 that says that these things are moving um, and they're bouncing into each other. They're jiggling around, if you use the word that uh, Feynman likes. And so here is kind of my representation, and I won't draw an arrowhead on all of the H2O molecules, but to give you an idea, they're bouncing around, and if you then uh, put a little pressure gauge here, then this pressure gauge would take a reading, let me just put like a little arrow here, right there, and the, the way a pressure gauge reads, of course it reads the pressure, and the reason it's getting pressure is there's a little metal piece down here that's getting hit by these water molecules, or whatever the fluid is, air molecules, that are bouncing against it and pushing it, and so it's actually measuring how much it's getting hit, and so with why we call it a pressure gauge. It, 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 it's mechanical. It's like the one we did in the lab <coughs> yesterday where you, you, the uh, little mechanism actually moves and this little piece of metal actually comes up to here and with a little uh, rack and pinion gear here move the dial depending on how much it, it, it moves. And so there's actually this, this movement uh, going on. So if you have a particular pressure which is coming from the collision of these molecules, here's Bernoulli's effect. Bernoulli takes the next step and says, what would happen if you were to make this fluid start to flow? And so let me draw a second picture. And I will draw or make a bunch of dots again uh, representing a bunch of H2O molecules in here. Uh, I'll put our pressure gauge again. But what Bernoulli notices here, and then measures, and so I'll show you some experiments here, is that once you start it flowing, and so maybe, you know, maybe this is under pressure and then you open the knob over here and it goes rushing out, the motion of the molecules change. Now, they don't completely go in a direction towards the right. There still is some up and down motion on random. But what I am trying to say is 
most of the motion of the molecules now is to the right. There's a flow going on. And what that means then for the pressure gauge is the molecules don't really go up as much as they used to. They don't hit the pressure gauge as much. And because of that, the pressure then drops. And so something over here where the molecules are stationary would have a high pressure, but once that, uh, once the molecules and the fluid start moving, the pressure goes down. And so this is referred to as the Bernoulli effect. And I'll put it in the words that uh, he uses. Bernoulli, and we'll just do it conceptually here, says then that the pressure in a fluid will decrease as its velocity increases. Uh, so let me say it again. Here's Bernoulli's reasoning, and it's a conceptual reasoning. Remember, Archimedes started off conceptually, and then we got to some math. We're not even going to go that far. We're not going to get into some math. We'll wait for uh, uh, Physics 121 for that. It's chapter 14. But let's at least talk about it conceptually about this fluid. And so I'll say it again. If the fluid is not flowing, they're moving in a very random direction, and the molecules are moving left, and they're mo left, and they're moving right, they're moving up, they're moving down. But the point is, a lot of them are moving up, and then over here, once you get them to move, they don't go up as much anymore. They still go up, so the pressure doesn't go to zero, but the pressure does go down, and so that's what Bernoulli is beginning to say. He's saying here, look, the faster you make the fluid go, the more the molecules move through the pipe. And as they move through that pipe, they're not moving upward or downward. And so sideways to the pipe, they won't hit. And so we say the pressure in the fluid then would decrease as its velocity increases. And that's the Bernoulli effect. And it has some very interesting consequences. It's kind of fun to watch. Maybe the, the simplest one to do first is this little, I'll call it, bridge, if you will. It's just a piece of folded paper. And if I, I kind of draw a, a picture of it, a kind of a cross section, I just folded a piece of paper that looks something like this. And the air molecules in the room are both above and below the deck of the bridge. But what I'm going to do here in a second is I'm going to take this straw and blow through the underside of this bridge. You might call the tunnel part of the bridge. You see, then these molecules right here under the bridge will start to move fast. And according to what we just reasoned out here, the pressure should go down. And so the molecules on top of the bridge will now be pushing down with a pressure greater than the molecules under the bridge. And then because of that, you should see some effect. That's why I make it out of paper, because paper, if you have a, a slightly greater force pushing down than pushing up, you'll actually see the paper then warp, and, 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 and sag is the correct word here. And so it'll, 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 it'll sag. And so I'm going to come over here, and well, let me give it a, a try here. Uh, first of all, I'll just kind of hold the bridge into place so I don't accidentally blow it, blow it off here. But if I blow, you'll see, sure enough, 
the molecules on the outside still remaining at the same pressure, but the ones in the tunnel go to a lower pressure and it's just kind of squeezing it down like that. And so very simple, but I, but I think quite obviously dramatic. Watch, uh, here's another fun one to do. Uh, here's a set of two empty aluminum cans. Okay, uh, they're just hanging from, from string. You can see how they easily shake and rock and they're very light. Uh, but a fun question to ask with Bernoulli's principle here is, okay, what would happen if I were to blow, and I'll just use my mouth and blow right between the two? Because see, right now, and I'll just look at the Coca-Cola can here and I'll get the other one out of the way here for a second. We'll put it up there. <laughs> Maybe I won't. Okay. But see, right now, I would say that there is air molecules on this side and air molecules on this side. And they're each hitting the can and they're hitting it equal. But as soon as I come over to this side and I blow, these molecules all start going in this direction. They don't hit the can anymore. So the pressure, the pressure on this side drops and the molecules out here push in. So my fluid for this, just like the, the, the bridge here, is the air molecules. And so putting the two cans together then should show that this can get pushed here and this can should get pushed here and of course the can should then come together. Of course then once they come together and I'm blowing they bounce all over the place. So you, you got to watch this right at the very uh, beginning but my, my first little blow, the, they come right together. Maybe that was too hard of a blow. I mean they just came together right away here. Ready? And they just pull right in. One, two, three. And so they just boom come right together here. And so that's this Bernoulli effect. This whole idea of this low pressure. It's, it's why I kind of like to do this uh, little uh, experiment. Um, um, my beach ball is a, a little flat, but I think that's going to be okay. But, but, but watch this. I have, and this will be my fluid, this little shot vac. And so when I turn it on, it begins to blow here. And so just like I, I did over here, as I, as I blow, and I'll say it again, wh where the speed is the greatest, the pressure is the lowest. That's this whole idea of the Bernoulli effect. So if I were to take this flow, and so I'll take my shop vac, and so here's the opening of the shop vac, and the air is is flowing. Like this aluminum can over here, what if I were to put an object, in this case I'll use a beach ball, right next to it. You see before it's blowing, so let me kind of erase this, there would be molecules on each side of the beach ball. And those molecules would be roughly stationary. That's this beginning part with Bernoulli. There'd be a certain pressure. There would be an equal pressure on the left and the right hand side of the, of the beach ball. But once the fluid starts to flow, the pressure is going to drop where the velocity has, has increased. So in this case, with the flowing on here, these molecules would start moving and so this would be the low pressure and then this would remain the high pressure. So in other words, the, the molecules on each side of the beach ball are not equal. There's a high side and a low side and the high side means it would push it towards the low side. And so what I'm going to hopefully happens here is if I take my hand and I just kind of hold it right here, as I get close to this blowing wind, you'll see that it just kind of pushes it right out of my hand. But then it even gets better. I'll draw the picture so you can kind of see it, but once it sucks it out of my hand, 
then the beach ball gets right in the middle of the airstream and the air hits the, the beach ball and gets split half and half around the beach ball and because the air is moving on each side and it's on each side equally there is a low pressure I'll, I'll say it again remember this is what the Bernoulli effect is the Bernoulli effect is saying that the pressure of the fluid decreases as its velocity increases but because they're both low they are also both equal and so where it pulled it out in, from my hand and into the airstream once it gets in the center of the airstream it's kind of stuck there it's equal now you might say well what about the momentum didn't it pull it out of your hand okay fine but watch this if the momentum carries the beach ball over to here and so now the airflow is on the right hand side of the beach ball there's going to be a low pressure here and there's not going to be any air flowing on this side so this side is a high pressure and so if the beach ball goes too far it ends up actually being pushed back by the air molecules so the air molecules originally push it into the flow it's, uh, you might say it's actually happy being in the flow but if it goes too far the air molecules push it back inside the flow and so it is surprisingly trapped uh, to some degree now obviously I could push it real hard with my hand and get it out of there but it is a small way trapped the flowing of the air and the air molecules that aren't flowing the combination of those two kind of trap it in there well watch let's see if you can you can see that so I'll turn on the air so here's the here's the flowing air here's the beach ball I'll just bring the beach ball near the flow and you'll see it just pulls it right out of my hand there it is and then more than that hopefully you saw not only did it pull it out of my hand but as it went this way it pulled it back and you can see that if I if I give it a little nudge as long as it's not too big of a nudge it's trapped in here in fact it's trapped enough that it wants to stay in the flow it is definitely in there and trapped and so this is that Bernoulli effect in fact it's one of the reasons why that uh, sometimes during heavy rains and flooding and somebody gets swept into this fast moving river they're, they're kind of stuck there they, they can swim all they want to try to get out of the river but it's really really difficult the, the low pressure is in the center of this flow and so as they're trying to swim out here the pressure is pushing them backwards in so it takes a lot of effort to get out of this fast moving uh, river here so this is a I think a really good example of a, a Bernoulli effect here uh, in fact let me let me take this a, a step further um, I have then a Venturi tube here and let me kind of draw the uh, setup here maybe I uh, need to kind of clean this off what do I do with my wet rag here ah there it is but a Venturi tube as you can see there has part of the tube at a smaller diameter and that smaller diameter means that in order for the fluid in this case air to go rushing through it it's got to speed up uh, let me see if I can draw a picture and so I have a tube that on both sides are kind of fat which I'll come over here and so on this side it's it's kind of fat and so I'm going to hook it up to the shop vac 
And so the fluid is going to be going through here. And if you look at that tube, after it flows for a while, it then narrows. And all of this air that is coming here then has to go a lot faster to get through this smaller diameter. So it's in this place where the air molecules are going to go fast. And it's over here where they're going to go slow. And the, the whole reason it opens up again is because over here they slow down again. Now maybe you've even seen this with a, with, with a river. You know, a river, it's big and wide and it's going kind of slow. Then it narrows and it goes fast and then it spreads out again and so it goes slow. In fact, at a, in a lake you would say it really spreads out and you don't even really notice the, the movement of the water through the, the lake. It's moving so slow. But I'll say it again, you know, in order to get maybe, you know, a hundred molecules through here, uh, you would have to go really, really fast here. Uh, you, you can kind of see this on a freeway. Uh, a freeway, let's say you have, you know, over here four lanes and it narrows down to two lanes. Uh, from here on back, everybody's going slow. It's bumper to bumper and it's all backed up. And then it narrows and all the cars are merging. And then once the cars merge right here, boom, they just, they just all take off. And so really fast here and really slow here. But using this Bernoulli effect then, because they're going slow, I would say then this area is a high pressure. And then this area is a low pressure. And then what's fun to watch on this is then they slow down again and so we're back to high pressure and so the pressure goes back up. And you might even have noticed on here that I have little openings and those are there so I can actually record and measure the pressure. And so if I turn this on it's kind of loud but I'll try to talk over the top of it but this air is racing through. And so you can see the effect of the uh, pressure. I will use the flowing of the air, so these openings just let the air come rushing out. But we can see how much it comes rushing out by how much it levitates a little ping pong ball. So I can measure the pressure here. And so it's trapped in the flow and then I can measure the pressure here. And notice it doesn't stick up as high. That would tell me that the air comes rushing out. Higher pressure here than here. And then if I jump around to this side, if I put another ping pong ball here, you'll see that the pressure goes back up. And so it's a little higher than that one. And it's almost as high as that one. It's just not as high because we lost some air because I have an opening. But if these were just pressure gauges, it would go back up to the, to the same pressure. And so there's a noisy example of Bernoulli effect, that the pressure does change to, depending upon that uh, speed here. Now, why is that useful? Well, there's a, a bunch of cases. Uh, one of them is just right here. Uh, let me take all these objects out of my, my frisbee. But a frisbee or an airplane wing are a really good example of the Bernoulli effect here because both of them, and so here's a, here's a frisbee and the frisbee kind of has a, a rounded edge over the top and then back. And so if you throw a frisbee in this direction, the idea here is that the flow of the air is then going to be pretty fast over the top. And underneath, there's actually a little pocket, if you will, of stagnant air. 
And so remember, the low flowing air is where the high pressure is. And so these molecules up here are the ones that are then pushing this Frisbee upward. And so I would say under here then is a high pressure and up here is a low pressure. And it's the shape of this Frisbee then forcing the air to flow at different rates over the top versus under the bottom, which then result in a Bernoulli principle, which give these Frisbees kind of their, their fun appeal. That if I stand on one side of the room here and wind up and say, okay, watch it go, it, it, it flies really well. It, it, it actually flies. It, it does not follow a parabola like if I tossed a, a baseball. And an airplane wing isn't too much different than that. Uh, an airplane wing, uh, if this is the nose of the airplane and the cockpit, and if you kind of look at the wing of an airplane, the front edge of it is a little bowed, and the back edge is more tapered. Oh, maybe I should have made a dotted line there. But that way when you have air molecules and the plane is flying by, the molecules over the top and the molecules underneath don't travel the same speed. The ones going over the top of the wing actually go a little faster, making then a low pressure above the wing and a high pressure under the wing. And like the Frisbee then, we would say it's the air molecules that are actually lifting up this, this airplane. And so an airplane is, of course, lifted up by these air molecules. But in order, <coughs> excuse me, for the airplane to get lifted up, you have to have this flow. And the, I, I think it's, you already know this, but an airplane doesn't fly unless it is moving forward, unless it is moving in a forward direction and there is some minimum speed. The reason for that is an airplane using its wings will then get a low pressure and it has to get low enough that the difference between the low and the high pressure is enough to equal the weight of the airplane. And so uh, an airplane that is not moving will fall. Even an airplane that is only moving at 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 miles an hour will, will fall. And every then airplane will have a slightly different speed, but at some point it can begin to fly. It's a combination of how much the plane weighs, the shape of the wing, the size of the wing, but all of that determines then at what speed the airplane has to be going before its upward force coming from the, if I can call it the aerodynamics, that is the Bernoulli effect, is greater than the effect of the weight pulling the airplane down. In, in fact, sailboats do the same little game. You can think of a sailboat as being a wing on an airplane, but instead of being mounted so that it lifts you up vertically, the sail is mounted so it pulls you in a forward direction. And so uh, a sailboat looks, of course, something like this. Maybe here's the, the boat. And then, of course, up here then is the sail. And uh, the sail has this kind of wing shape with it. And so as the wind comes in and goes over, maybe I should bow this out, and then, of course, around the back, it'll go a little bit faster. And because of that, there's a low pressure on one side of the sail, and then that makes it move faster. In fact, surprisingly, the propeller on an airplane, and so here is a propeller 
And when you spin it, a propeller works with a Bernoulli effect, or at least half of it. Uh, propellers are actually a kind of a push and a pull because bec they're arc. And so if here's a propeller and it, you know, goes outward like this, and I'll just make the other side go outward, as it spins, the air molecules go over the top and underneath. Now, they're also curved, so it pushes the air. And so as this thing spins, there is a curve to it which pushes the air back. That's more of a, a Newton's laws. Uh, that is, there is a Newton's third law. It pushes on the air and the air pushes back on the prop. And, and that's how I explained it back in chapter 3. That how does a prop work? It pushes on the air and the air pushes back. And, and then that's true. But that's only half true because the other part of the prop is that it spins and the roundedness, the arc of it, makes a Bernoulli effect in the front of the propeller. And that makes a low pressure and then that's what pulls it forward. And a helicopter blade, the same thing as it spins around. It goes over the top. There's also a downdraft, but it's over the top that makes a low pressure. That's an, a Bernoulli effect. And it lifts the, the helicopter up. And so there's a lot of this, this applications when it, you know, comes to this, this aerodynamics and the usefulness of the Bernoulli effect here. And uh, a fun one to see then is kind of like this sailboat. And it was actually tried, believe it or not, in the 1920s. It didn't turn out to be very useful or unsuccessful. But what if you did this? What if you took this sailboat and instead of putting a sail with a shape with a bow like, a, like an airplane wing, what if you mounted a big cylinder? And you spin the cylinder. Uh, you see, if you take something spinning, and let me take kind of a top view here. So if here's the cylinder, and you're moving the ship, and the wind is blowing, or maybe the ship's not moving, and the wind is blowing. But as this cylinder rotates, it will take the air and force it to go on one side of the cylinder because of the spin. And with all this air going on one side, this is where the air goes fast. And so this is where you have the low pressure. Where of course the other side is where the air is going slow. So this is where you then have your high pressure. <clears throat> and so there would be a push in this direction from the high pressure to the low pressure. And so a spinning object that is in the wind or a spinning object that is thrown through the air can have an interesting effect because of the spin. The spin has this additional aerodynamic effect and, and that's what I'm trying to, to show you here. And so let me spin a couple of things. I'll spin this cylinder to show you, but I'll also spin a tennis ball and spin a baseball and spin a styrofoam ball and spin a beach ball. And so as they move or as the wind blows, the combination of the spin and the movement of the air can end up getting a difference in pressure and that's this Bernoulli effect and you can get some interesting consequences. So here I have a cart that I'm hoping has a little cylinder and a string. And when I pull this string, let me not pull it all the way yet, but when I pull this string it's going to spin in this direction. Now if I also take some wind, and so that's why I've got this little prop out here, 
And so it'll blow, in fact, I'll, you can see it blow the string. And so as it blows, and so let's say it's spinning this way, and then I put the fan right here and blow it. Whoops, looks like the string's getting all tangled under there. Let me save that. Okay. And so I'm going to spin it, and I'm going to blow. And when I put this right here, hopefully what you will see is as the air hits the spinning cylinder, it will force the air to this side. So this will be the low pressure. Over here will be a high pressure, and it will actually push the cylinder, and that's why it's on this cart, so it can actually move. And so let me give it a, give it a try here. And so step one. Pull the string. Spinning cylinder. And it spins really well. But notice it's not moving. Wind. And so if I put the wind right here, there it goes. Try it again. But this time, I'll do it from this end. And so as I blow this way, it's going to force the end wind on this side. So this will be the low pressure. So it'll get pushed that way. Yep, and sure enough, and it looks like I don't have this exactly level. Let me see if I can do a little better here. So that, if I go that way, and I go that way, Oh yeah, let me do a little better. But it looks like that way and that way. All right. Now it's barely spinning. I might have to start it again. But let's see what happens. But sure enough, it goes that way. And it goes the other way. And so that's the Bernoulli effect.